uh, our older group in Tennessee ministering right now. Um, have our younger group ready to go to camp. Carrie's doing an ex- outstanding job with our young people, and I'm really thrilled with her ministry. Carrie, thank you so much. And welcome to you. I'm George Gasperson. I'm the pastor here at Christ Community Church. If you happen to be with us for the very first time, I want you to know how glad we are that you're here. It's a big deal to us, and we hope that you come back again. So during the summer, we're talking about a, a, a sermon series, a message series called Deeper. And I call it Deeper because each week we're talking about a spiritual discipline that helps us grow more mature in our faith and become more committed in our lives to Christ, to be more committed to each other in our relationships, and to be more committed to our church. So last week we talked about the discipline of forgiveness, forgiving someone of something that uh, they did to us. This morning's topic is kind of related to last week. It's a little bit of a part two. But today we're going to be talking about the discipline of restitution, how to right the wrongs of our past. In his book, Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary Christians, my friend Keith Drury tells the time about a time in his life where he had to make restitution. He was in the seventh grade. Now, guys, remember way back when we were in seventh grade? Women, this will be more of an informational uh, issue for you, but guys, remember when we were back in the seventh grade, the very top entry of our priority list was impressing girls. Remember that? Well, the same for Keith. He got invited to one of those parties that we used to go to when we were in grade school. Remember, somebody would throw a party and we would go over to their house on a Friday night or a Saturday night and have fun, that sort of thing. He got invited to a party. Impressing the girls was high on his list, and so he felt like and came up with the idea that the best way to impress a girl was to grow a mustache. But you can probably guess the issue with a seventh grader and a mustache. It was late October. It was getting close to Halloween, and so after school one day, Keith and his friend stopped by a department store to look and see what kind of Halloween costumes they had on sale, and that's when he saw it. The answer to his prayers and the one thing that would meet his need, it was a fancy stick-on mustache in a fancy plastic pack. That was going to be perfect to impress the girls. But there was one problem. Keith didn't have any money. You can probably guess what happened. When no one was looking, he grabbed that fancy mustache and he slid it into his pocket. He took it home. He wore it to the party. The girls were not impressed. Now, Keith knew what he did was wrong. He knew he ought to go back and make things right, but there were some issues. Keith's dad happened to be a pastor, and he didn't want to get in that kind of trouble at all. Keith had a friend with him at the store who knew what he did. He didn't want to get his friend in trouble either. So, like many of us might choose, Keith chose to not go back. Well, time passed, and the conviction over what he did gradually kind of melted away. Occasionally the guilt would resurface, but he would dismiss it with thoughts like this. Uh, It was such a little thing, and it was so long ago. Every time he went to church and he heard somebody speaking or teaching about restitution, he remembered that stupid little mustache. Twenty Years later, as a man who had grown up and now he has a family, he was off on a spiritual retreat 
and he was praying. And Keith said, of all the things God brought up as a topic of conversation, it was that mustache. And Keith knew that God was saying, it's time to take care of this issue. And he also knew that the longer he put it off, he would be guilty of more than just spiritually dragging his feet. It would be out and out disobedience toward God. So a couple of weeks later, Keith and his family were traveling. They happened to be in the general geographic location that this mustache incident happened 20-some years ago. So Keith knew what he had to do. He loaded up his five-year-old son in the car, and off they went in search of that store. He secretly hoped that would go out of business since that time, but it hadn't. And on the way, he explained to his five-year-old what he had done and where they were going and what they were about to do. And so they entered the store. Keith talked to the clerk. He pulled out his wallet, and he paid for the mustache. On the drive back, the five-year-old was completely silent. But Keith knew that he was processing what happened, and sure enough, a few minutes later, the five-year-old son spoke up, and he said, Dad, I just think it would be better if you didn't take things that didn't belong to you because you wouldn't have to go back like this. <laughs> That's restitution. It's going back and making things right when you hurt people or when you took from them. Restitution is restoring to the original owner what's rightfully theirs, their property or their respect or their reputation. Restitution is returning those tools that you brought home from work that didn't belong to you. Restitution is paying the unreported taxes that you haven't paid because you hid them from the government by taking the payment in cash. Restitution is utility companies granting refunds because they overcharged their customers. But restitution deals with more than just property. It's going back and making things right for the, hurt, for the hurtful things you've said or that you've done. You know, it's one thing to go back and pay for a toy mustache. But it's another to go back to a spouse or a parent or a co-worker and ask for forgiveness. Restitution is making amends for a sharp tongue or harsh words or a bad attitude. And I believe it's harder to make restitution for relationship issues than it is for property issues. The reason why is because restitution demolishes our pride. It's one of the most painful disciplines of the obedient life. Now this issue of going back and wrong, righting wrongs that happened, restitution. This is not just a good idea that people have come up with. Restitution is God's idea. And the Bible speaks specifically of our call to go back and make right what is wrong in our past. God required the Israelites in the Old Testament to make restitution. Remember when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments? If, if your theology comes from Charlton Heston's movie about the Ten Commandments, then you might come away with the idea that the only thing God was doing up on top of that mountain was receiving those two blocks of, of, of stone where God wrote the Ten Commandments. But actually, the Bible teaches that Moses was up there for days and days and days because God set out a long list of, of procedures and laws about how to live, and restitution is solidly in that law. Let me give you a couple of examples of what the Bible says about 
the, uh, the, the principle of restitution. This is from Exodus chapter 22. And this is part of what God gave Moses on the mountain. Whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and is struck a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. But if it happens after sunrise, the defender is guilty of bloodshed. God says this, anyone who steals must certainly make restitution, there's the word. But if they have nothing, they must be sold to pay for their theft. See how serious this is? If the stolen animal is found alive in their possession, whether ox or donkey or sheep, they must pay back double. And if anyone grazes their livestock in a field or vineyard and lets them stray, and they have and the graze in someone else's field, the offender must make restitution from the very best of their own field or vineyard. But making restitution to God involves more than just property. This is another excerpt from the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. God uh, writes this, The Lord said to Moses, If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them, or left in their care, or about something stolen, or if they cheat their neighbor, or if they find lost property and lie about it, or if they swear falsely about any such sin that people may commit. When they sin in any of these ways and realize their guilt, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was entrusted to them or the lost property they found or whatever it was they swore falsely about. They must make restitution in full, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the owner on the day they present their guilt offering. But it's not just in the Old Testament that the Bible teaches us about restitution. There's a great story in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, that involves a guy that I guarantee you, you know about. Remember the guy Zacchaeus, the wee little man who climbed up in the sycamore tree? That's how we remember Zacchaeus. But after this morning, you're going to remember Zacchaeus for another reason. It's because this is a guy who made restitution. Listen to what Luke wrote. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to the, be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, and here comes the restitution, get this. He said, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. See, in both the Old and the New Testament, the Bible is clear that the practice of going back and making right that which was wrong is something that God has desired and commanded people who are interested in living a surrendered, obedient life to do. So let's answer this question, why? Why make restitution? What's so important about it, especially if the offense might be small, like that stupid little mustache? Or what, what's the use in opening up an issue that is so old that most everybody has forgotten about it? Well, here are some reasons. First, write this one down. We go back and make restitution because this is what God commands for us to do. It's what God says. Restitution is a matter of obedience. 
It's what spiritually mature people do. The reason we don't like to make restitution is not because it's unbiblical. It's because of our pride. Making restitution requires us to swallow our pride, to admit we were wrong, and would rather save our pride than make restitution. But you know what? God has always been more interested in our holiness than he has in our comfort. And restitution moves us toward a holy life. Here's a second reason. Why do you make restitution? Because making restitution restores our joy. There is a deep, abiding, personal joy that comes from doing what God has asked us to do. You ever done something wrong to someone else and realized it was wrong, and you thought to yourself, you know, that, that just wasn't so cool. So you get down on your knees, and you say, God, I, that was wrong. I'm sorry, and I ask your forgiveness. And you experience forgiveness, but then there's this, there's this gnawing sense of guilt that won't go away. Here's what's happened. You've sought the vertical forgiveness, but you've yet to seek the horizontal forgiveness between you and the person that you injured or that you hurt. And once we make restitution, once we get the horizontal squared away like the vertical, then we regain our joy. A third reason why we make restitution, because making restitution gives you a story to share. Hey, imagine if you were teaching your children or your grandchildren about the principles of restitution. What story would you use? My friend Keith had a ready-made story about a mustache. And imagine the impression that five-year-old got when he saw his father make restitution. When you go back and make restitution, God will use your story too to help other people. I got one more reason that's a good reason why we make restitution. It's because restitution vaccinates us against future wrongs. Now, I don't know that there's anything that would make us break the habit we've got of occasionally sticking our foot in our mouth and embarrassing ourselves and hurting other people. But listen, making restitution comes pretty close. Because the next time you're tempted to take something that doesn't belong to you, you'll remember the humiliation of having to go back and say, I messed up the last time you did that. When you lose your temper and you let go with some ungraceful comment about somebody, you'll remember the embarrassment about having to go back and ask for forgiveness for saying something stupid. When you make restitution, it's an experience that will help keep you from making the same mistake again. So now comes the big question, okay? So how do you go about making restitution? If this is what God wants, if there are good reasons to do it, then how do we get it done? Well, I don't know that there is a perfect laundry list, but I've got some suggestions. Here's how I would start. Seek God first. If you ask God to lead you, he'll show you where to begin. You don't have to manufacture some kind of laundry list of people that you need to go and see. The Holy Spirit is an expert at letting us know what to do and how to do it. So if God impresses on you a wrong that needs to be made right, then get busy. The key is to be receptive and obedient when he points something out in our life. Seek God first. And second is this. Think in advance what you want to say. Identify first the main offense that you're going 
to talk about? Is it harshness? Is it a critical spirit? Is it unkindness? Is it anger? What is it? Did it involve something that didn't belong to you? Now, let me relieve you of a burden here. You don't have to type out a 10-page term paper with footnotes and take it in and read it to the person. You simply say, look, I was wrong when I did or said this, and I am asking you to forgive me. If you say a whole lot more than that, then you're apt to cause more problems than you're solving. And let me say this. Sometimes both parties bear guilt. You ever been in one of those kind of situations? So what happens if you were wrong, but they were wrong too? Well, I can tell you that you aren't responsible for anyone else's behavior except yours. And when you admit your fault, you're not saying that they were right. You're just owning your own stuff. A, a third suggestion would be this. Pick the right time and place. There are better times than others to make restitution. Try not to go and talk to someone if they're exceptionally busy or tired or stressed. And there's a question in some people's minds about how public restitution needs to be. I remember a time when I was in college, I served on our dorm council. That means you kind of, I don't know what it means. It means you're just kind of on a, a little committee to settle some disputes for the people that live in your dorm. That's what I was doing there. And there was a there was a guy who went on a date with his girlfriend, and evidently they went a little bit further than they wanted to go physically while they were out on the date. And so this guy felt like he needed to make restitution by confessing his actions in front of the whole dorm council. Well, his girlfriend was humiliated, and rightly so. See, restitution should only be as public as the offense. If the issue is a private one, then make restitution in private. And will you allow me to discourage virtual restitution? In other words, resist the urge of pecking out this little email that says, hey, I'm sorry for what happened back there. Especially if the issue is a serious one. A phone call where you actually speak to the person is better, but a face-to-face -face conversation is best. And then my fourth suggestion would be give a full confession. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Don't make excuses for what happened. Don't justify what happened. Don't lay out a whole bunch of extenuating circumstances where you say, you know, if this hadn't happened and if that hadn't been in place, then I would have never said or done or whatever, whatever happened. Just own what you did or own what you said and ask for forgiveness. Now, what I'm about to say next might sound nitpicky to you. It might simply sound like just a twist of words or semantics. But there are a couple of phrases that people like to use when they make restitution when if used only by themselves are inadequate for making restitutions. For instance, some people say things like this, you know, I was thinking how wrong both of us were when all that happened. That's just a tricky way of saying, hey, look, we share the blame here. Don't implicate anybody else. Just say, I was wrong. Here's another phrase. I apologize. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, isn't an apology part of restitution? Yes, it is. But if the only thing you say is, hey, look, I apologize for what happened, that is an, 
that is it's inadequate. It's because people apologize for minor stuff where it's not such a big deal. If the offense is big enough for restitution, then it needs to go further than just simply the words, I'm sorry. Say you were wrong and ask for forgiveness. Another phrase, I'm sorry. That's part of restitution, but that restitution is more than simply, I'm sorry. When a wrong has occurred, everybody's sorry for what happened to them. Restitution is more than letting people know that you just regret what you did. It's about admitting that you were wrong and asking for forgiveness. And one more. I didn't mean to. Again, part of restitution, but not entirely restitution. If this is all you say, well, you know, I know this happened, but I didn't mean to. What you're saying is, look, I'm a nurse. I'm a nice person. I don't normally do things like that, and you ought to know my motives. Listen, people don't know your motives. We can't judge each other's motives accurately all the time. Leave the excuses and the explanations behind. Admit what you did was wrong and ask for forgiveness. Let me share a real-life truth with you about making restitution. I have a feeling some of you have discovered this before, but I'll remind you of it anyway. Life doesn't always have a storybook ending. You know what I mean? We like to think that if God prompts us toward restitution, that if we just say, yes, Lord, I will, and then we just gather up all the courage that we have, and we go to that person, and we lay our heart out, and we do it exactly right. Look, what I did was wrong. I am asking you to forgive me. If we would just do that and humble ourselves, then wrongs would be righted. Then friendships would be restored. And everybody would live happily ever after. But you know what? Sometimes it just doesn't turn out that way. Because of spiritual immaturity, because of a hardened heart, because of a hundred different reasons, not everyone will agree to offer you forgiveness when you go back to them and make restitution. And I want you to know that hurts. And you'll be tempted to think that what you did was just a colossal waste of effort and time until you hear Jesus whisper the words to you, well done. And I want you to know that knowing that you did the right thing and you did what Jesus asked you to do will be enough to make up for the pain of not being forgiven. No matter what the other person decides to do, making restitution is always the right thing. And you will be spiritually blessed if you do. So we started this morning by the, with the story of a man who stole a stupid mustache when he was in the seventh grade. And 20-some years later, God was still prompting him to make it right. Why was God still after this man 20 years later? God didn't let it go because what my friend did was wrong. And it needed to be made right. And I believe our willingness to make restitution when God prompts us to is a litmus test of deeper spiritual 
maturity. You know how so many people judge their spiritual maturity these days? Too often we define ourselves and how mature we are by how well we obey the big stuff. You know what the big stuff is? Don't kill anybody. Don't run around on your husband or wife. Go to church. And when we do that big stuff, we start to think to ourselves, well, I'm, I'm all right. I've, I've got the big stuff down. That takes care of the minimum standards, so I guess I'm spiritually mature. Obedience to the big stuff is important. But it's the obedience in the smaller, deeper spiritual things that separates the crowd from the real disciples. It takes a much deeper level of spiritual maturity to humble ourselves, to swallow our pride, and to say, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? And if we refuse, no one else will know except us and except God. So because of the contents of this message today, I wonder if God might not be reminding you of some place in the past that's wrong and it needs to be right. It might be something that's happened years ago, but you know what? It might also be something that happened yesterday or last week, too. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about something, then I'm hopeful that this message this morning has given you the tools and the process and the courage to do what God has asked you to do. I am certainly not trying to manufacture guilt in your life. That's not my job. That's not my intent. That's, that's God's responsibility. But what I am trying to do is to, to help you know what to do with what God is asking you to do. I believe you can take a big step forward in your spiritual maturity by hearing what God has to say and just saying the words, yes, Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, I'm not sure many of us have the courage to pray the words, God, show me where I need to be humble and go back and ask for forgiveness. But you clearly teach that principle in the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments. It's an expectation that you have of us. So, Father, my prayer is that you would give us courage. Walk with us. Show us what to do. And I'm glad we can depend on you to be right there in the middle of the process. If there is some amends to be made and some restitution to be made, help us to be able to say yes. In your name that we pray, amen. And let me remind you before you go that our prayer team is here waiting for you. Maybe you need to pray for some courage to go make restitution. These people are ready to pray with you and give you all the courage that you need. Please remember your tithes and offerings on your way out. And if you're new here, I'd love to meet you in person in our new here area. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for coming. We'll do it again next week if you come back.